and growing, where people feel free to express their opinion slandering their elected officials and political leaders, and we must take this on at once. These videos will not be allowed to stand. They must be demonetized. Demonetize these videos if you see something. It is your duty to create a wonderful and new YouTube and to inform the authorities and demonetize. Well, a handful of tech companies increasingly dominate the daily lives of Americans, what could go wrong? Whether you're shopping, socializing, working, or learning, odds are you'll be spending an awful lot of time using Amazon, Facebook, Google, and a couple of others. Can we count on the goodwill of these companies? That's a rhetorical question. Dennis Prager operates Prager University, which creates videos online to educate people. He's recently sued Google and its subsidiary YouTube. He says they've deliber deliberately restricted his videos, so they have less reach and are ineligible for ad revenue. Dennis Prager joins us tonight. Dennis, that's a heavy-duty charge. Um, clearly, I don't think you would have filed a lawsuit without evidence to support it. Tell us what you know, why they did this <laughs> to you. They have uh, placed on their restricted list. That means that it can't be viewed in libraries, in schools, or any home that filters out pornography, for example. Cannot be seen in any of those places. Our videos are as, as innocent as exists on the internet. Four Pulitzer Prize winners, professors from Stanford, MIT, Harvard, Yale. I mean, it is about as normative con and conservative, but we don't only have conservatives. Alan Dershowitz has given a number of videos, and by the way, his video was placed on the restricted list as well. Uh, oh, there we have, we, when you understand which ones, for example, uh, for example, I gave a video, and I only give 15% of the uh, 260 or so videos that are there, and they're all five minutes long. We have 500 million views this year, so it's rather large. This is a big deal, this suit. And I have a video, for example, on the Ten Commandments. So I have one five-minute video per commandment. The one that I have on Thou Shalt Not Murder, how's that? That has been placed on the restricted list. Uh, we have a video, America That's Must demented. Lead. So do liberals have a video, America Must Lead, but our America Must Lead, and I believe it was given by Brett Stephens, not exactly a flaming conservative, even that was, uh, was placed on the restricted list. It's all entirely due to our content and being conservative, and uh, they, well, so uh, when, they need to be called uh, on this. Well, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. What you've said, and I believe you because I know you and I know that you're a, a, a religious and moral man, um, and you're smart. So you bring this argument to them, to Google and its subsidiary YouTube, and you say, why are you doing this to me? Right. What was their response? Inappropriate for children. <laughs> well, but did, I mean, the, the, did they is, give there examples? There is no answer. No, 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 that's it. That's the, they have a stock phrase, but we actually finally got it from a human, not from some, from automatic, some automatic response. And they still said inappropriate, but we, we still don't understand why. We have a Victor Davis Hanson, yes. whom I'm sure you know. He's Frequent a, a wonderful, wonderful human being. Yes. He gives a, he gives a five minute course on the history of the Korean War. That if America looks good, it's, sen it's uh, not sent. Well, censored is probably an appropriate word. It's restricted. If Israel looks good, it's restricted. Uh, uh, it, it's it, it's almost it's almost uh, uh, predictable what they would uh, restrict. And and it's the point is this, that uh, they should say, look, we are liberal or left wing organizations. We don't want to give a forum for others. Yeah. And then I have I have no issue. Well, but they, that, have they say but that they, they are they a have too much power forum. over our information. And that, that's not honest. In perhaps the most Orwellian statement written since Orwell himself finished 1984, Google explained the firing, quote, part of building an open, inclusive environment means fostering a culture in which those with alternative views, including different political views, feel safe sharing their opinions. Okay. So in order to foster a culture in which those with alternative political views could feel safe sharing their opinions, Google fired James Damore for the crime of sharing his alternative political opinions. Huh. At no point did, you, did Google rebut any of the points Damore made. The fact he made them was enough. Raising questions was his crime. Now, why does any of this matter? 
Well, it matters because Google is the most powerful company in the history of the world. It's the portal through which the bulk of our information flows. That means that if Google isn't on the level, neither is our understanding of the world. To an unprecedented extent, Google controls reality. Now, Google has already shown a disturbing willingness to distort reality for ideological ends. Until they were sued for it in 2008, Google refused to allow anti-abortion advertisements on its platforms, even though they freely allowed pro-abortion ones. On the flip side, Google often blacklists certain sites from hosting ads, which denies them revenue. Recently, Google-owned YouTube has introduced procedures to cut off revenue to, quote, offensive content. What's offensive? Who decides? Well, it's an opaque process controlled by employees of the company, and the last two weeks have shown us conclusively what those employees are like. No surprise, then, that the offensive label is routinely being applied to right-of-center content creators they don't like. Google has also appointed itself the online sheriff of fake news, changing its search algorithms so that what it calls misleading or offensive news doesn't even show up in searches. You will never know it existed. It's now obvious Google cannot be trusted to do any of this. Why should a company that shuts down free speech for political reasons have the power to dictate what the world knows and thinks? Well, of course, it shouldn't have that power. Google's longtime motto was, don't be evil. Today it uses, do the right thing. We should have seen this coming. Those are supervillain slogans if there was ever such a thing. None of this can continue. In Europe, Google's already been hit with a nearly $3 billion fine for violating antitrust law. Congress here and the Trump administration could go, should go further than that. Since it has the power to censor the Internet, Google should be regulated like the public utility it is to make sure it doesn't further distort the free flow of information to the rest of us. That needs to happen immediately. Too bad it's come to this. A lot of us trusted Google not to be evil. Silly us. Well, Google is policing the content posted to YouTube, and they're using a thoroughly discredited left-wing group to do that. Google has creating a group of trusted flaggers who will help the company monitor alleged extremist content on the website. One of those trusted flaggers is not trusted at all. It's the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's not an expert on the South or poverty or the law. John it's a hate group. It is a hate group, too. Let's just be honest about that. Eric Schiffer is a tech entrepreneur, and he joins us tonight. Um, so, Eric, you follow this stuff closely. How did the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is wholly discredited and wholly political, wind up policing content on the most powerful company in the world? How'd that happen? You know, it's hard to understand. I think what was going on, Tucker, is that uh, these, you know, YouTube, in essence, was trying to uh, be inclusive in their mind and really trying to have an optical uh, perspective that they were being uh, and doing everything they could because they were taking a lot of heat from people saying they weren't doing enough to stop ISIS and extremist groups. Right. So that's what led to this. But it's just too far. I mean, you know, I, I can't imagine how they can have this group. And really, in my opinion, uh, more should be done and uh, a lot more. So, I mean, for people watching at home who think that you know, Southern Poverty Law Center sounds like a legitimate group, give us an example of the people or movements or websites they have deemed out, you know, beyond the pale, haters, extremists. Who have they called that? Well, I mean, Laura Ingram, uh, Ben Carson. I mean, you know, so you've got uh, conservative uh, figures that yes. they are labeling. Uh, and uh, I think it's gone too far. It really, in my opinion, uh, that YouTube should fire uh, Southern Poverty immediately from all YouTube monitoring because uh, it's an outrage. I mean, to have the possibility of an anti-conservative hitting delete for partisan reasons or on any content that's relevant to uh, patriotic Americans. And I think Google really needs to be, and YouTube, be transparent. I mean, uh, moving forward to monitor content and have a no right. policy uh, related to anyone that has any political affiliation or any reputation uh, for being par uh, partisan. And I think also there really needs to be an apology uh, to patriotic Americans that use YouTube for this gross oversight and unfair uh, process is, that's really done uh, not with any kind of disclosure in the choice of using Southern poverty for right. the monitoring of content. It just it just doesn't make sense. And frankly, it opens up a bunch of things. I mean, when they're doing yeah, this to conservatives, what else are they doing it to? Well, that's a great question. We don't know because, of course, it's totally opaque. And by the way, whatever happened to saying what you think is true, even if people don't like it? But I guess that's 
passing. In the meantime, do Americans know just what the companies they support are endorsing? The Southern Poverty Law Center, in their quest to root out what they consider hate in this country, labels these two people, Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council and activist Ian Hersey Alley, as part of that group that they're against. She responded by saying this, quote, I'm a black woman, a feminist, and a former Muslim who has consistently opposed political violence, yet the SPLC has the audacity to label me an extremist. But the SPLC has been the beneficiary of huge corporate donations from the likes of J.P. Morgan and Apple. And that prompted Kim Strassel in a Wall Street Journal op-ed today to note this. By funding this list, J.P. Morgan and Apple are saying they support labeling Christian organizations that oppose gay marriage as, quote, hate groups. Victor Davis Hansen is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and he joins me now. Victor, welcome. Very good to have you on the program Thanks. tonight. Um, I, this you. piece by Kim Strassel caught my eye this morning, and we had looked at, um, you know, obviously your piece the other day on the war monuments, but, but this one to start with, in terms of this sort of progressive leaning at corporations where they feel that if they don't back groups like the SPLC, they might be criticized, there might be backlash from some of their consumers, but they may get just the opposite here. Yeah, they do. They're business people, so they look at the world in a cost-benefit analysis, and they've come to the conclusion that a few activists like the SPLC represent a greater danger by defamation to them or blackmail or boycotts than do the vast majority of Americans who basically agree with the tolerance and classically liberal views of Hersey Alley. And more importantly, the SPLC, to, take, to be specific, looks at minority people as a Borg, that they have to have uniform views, and when somebody who's brilliant beautiful, black, ex-Muslim, courageous female like Hersey Alley comes out and speaks empirically and, and talks about the world the way she sees it in a logical and rational manner, that represents an existential threat to the SL SPLC. And corporations, as I said, are just amoral. They react to what the perceived profit loss calculus is. And we saw a similar thing with many of them stepping away from these councils that the White House was operating for the same reason, right? They, they just felt that they sort of looked at their P&L and decided it wasn't going to be worth it for them because they're likely to get blasted on Twitter and on social media by organizations that may or may not represent the feelings of the American people at all. No, and most people are traditionalists and they live and let live, especially conservatives, and they're not the type of people when they see something that bothers them to get everybody riled up and to boycott and to and to magnify their numbers like as, as people on the progressive left do and so business people just react to perceived pressures we've seen that with ESPN and the Asian American sportscaster uh, psychodrama we see it with the USC horse that happened to be named Traveler but I think corporations really have to ask themselves how long can they be this immoral and just react to perceived business decisions without offending people who may come out of the shadows and finally say enough is enough Let's put up this hate group map that the SPLC put out that included groups like the Family Research Council. I mean, Victor, if you look at this, you would think there's just hate crawling across the entire country. And, you know, you better just stay in your house and hunker down. Yeah, they, they're bullies and they intimidate people. They're sort of like the McCarthyites of the 1950s. I, I've been a target of them for just spe speaking about in support of assimilation, integration, and intermarriage in the case of immigrants. And they feel, feel that is somehow discriminatory. So they, they're riding high because of the Charlottesville incident, and uh, they've got a lot of donations, and it's gone to their head. And they're hubristic, and they better be careful because I think they're going to create a backlash not only among the American people, but... Maybe the corporations that, that... There are dangerous hate groups in America who will warn us about them. The media have an answer. The Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center, based in that building in Alabama, calls itself the premier group monitoring hate groups. Looking at their map of such groups, you'd think America was consumed by hate. I once believed in the center's mission. Well-meaning people still do. Apple just gave them a million dollars. But what donors don't know is that today the center smears people who don't deserve to be smeared. The presence of radical Islam. This woman grew up in Somalia, suffered female genital mutilation. So now she speaks out against radical Islam. For that, the center put her on its list. 
Multiculturalism failed these communities. This man was once an Islamic extremist, but then he decided radical Islam was wrong, and now he criticizes the radicals. The center labels him an anti-Muslim extremist, too. Join the fight against hate and bigotry. Visit SPLCenter.org. I do think that we have a problem with hate in this country. We put about 10 of these major hate groups out of business. The center's leaders, Richard Cohen and Morris Dees, would not talk to me. So commentator Nomiki Kant stepped up to defend them. They have a history, a long history, of fighting against extremists like the KKK. History, yes. But they labeled skeptical Muslims like Ayan Hirsi Ali as haters. If you have a horrible experience with religion, that's one thing. It's another thing to use those experiences as ammunition against others who are practicing their religion peacefully. But they're just speaking, criticizing it. Of course she has the right to free speech, as does the Southern Poverty Law Center has a right to push back. We can stand together against hate. The center also calls the Family Research Council a hate group. The definition of a marriage is what it's been for 5,000 years. It's the union of a man and a woman. I often disagree with the council myself. But do they belong on this hate map? When they don't agree with you politically, they're going to list you as a hater. You are haters. You hate gays. No, I don't hate gay people. And, and, uh, and I know gay people, and I have worked with gay people. But once you're labeled a hate group, you become a target. Developing now word of a shooting at the Family Research Council there in Washington. One man was so enraged by what the center said about the Family Research Council, he went to their headquarters to kill people. A man shot a security guard in the arm. Fortunately, that guard stopped the man before he could shoot anyone else. He told the judge that he was there to kill as many of us as possible because we were a hate group. The council's offices were attacked by a guy with a gun. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't deserve this. There's always extremists out there and it's unfortunately the world that we live in and, and you know hopefully people can kind of separate that. The center also smears the Ruth Institute, a Christian group that believes gays should not have an equal right to adopt children. They're not haters. I like gay people. I have no problem with gay people. That's not the issue. The issue is what are we doing with kids and the definition of who counts as a parent. What if a gay couple had a civil union and adopted kids? There could be cases where the best person for a particular child would be their Uncle Harry and his boyfriend. You know, that could be. But we owe it to the children to give them the best we can, which generally is a married mother and father. So you're a hater. <laughs> when the center put her on its hate map, the Ruth Institute's bank sent her this letter. We've determined that you're an organization that promotes hate, violence, harassment, and so therefore we're not doing business with you. And we went and checked our website and we were already down. The Ruth Institute and the Family Research Council are still on the hate list. There's no appeal. I sure don't know how you get off. I suspect the center keeps its hate list long because crying hate brings in lots of money. Morris Dees' salary is more than my entire annual budget. So yeah, whatever they're doing, it pays. Years ago, Harper's Magazine reported that the center's the wealthiest civil rights group in America, one that spent most of its time and money on a fundraising campaign. Now, Morris Dees did once promise to stop fundraising once his endowment hit $55 million. But when he reached $55 million, he changed that to $100 million, saying that would allow them to cease costly fundraising. But when they reached $100 million, they didn't stop. Today, they have an endowment that uh, now is over $320 million, much of which is in offshore accounts, Caymans and places like that. In How do you know? Oh, we look at their 990s. And it says Cayman Islands? Yeah. They pay some of their people more than 400000 a year. Well, it, you know, it's 2017. <laughs> it costs a lot of money to exist in this world. Give me a break. The Southern Poverty Law Center now lists people like Ben Carson, Laura Ingram, and Jeannie Pirro as extremists. But it doesn't list Antifa, the hate group that beats up people on the right. The center has become a hate group itself. It's now a left-wing, money-grabbing slander machine. Well, as you already know, if you've been paying any attention at all, the Southern Poverty Law Center is an entirely fraudulent enterprise. The organization has nothing to do with the South, or with poverty. It's a left-wing political group that uses hate crime designations to target its ideological enemies and to crush people. 
In 2012, the SPLC inspired a shooting attack on the Family Research Council by labeling, labeling the innocuous Christian organization a hate group. Just last month, the SPLC paid $3.3 million for falsely calling the Quilliam Foundation, quote, anti-Muslim extremists. We could go on. The Southern Poverty Law Center lies. They are utterly reckless and they're totally dishonest. With that in mind, it was shocking to discover, as jaded as we are, and this show has discovered it exclusively, that the FBI has a long history of collaborating with the Southern Poverty Law Center. In 2009, for example, the FBI called the SPLC, quote, a well-known, established, and credible organization that monitors domestic terrorism in the U.S. The SPLC repeatedly has been allowed to brief FBI personnel on alleged terror threats to this country. Disturbingly, though, this relationship is ongoing, if you can believe it. Despite multiple requests from this program, the FBI has refused to describe the extent of its collaboration with the L SPLC, we've asked repeatedly, or even to explain why it continues to work with a group like that. Instead, we've received meaningless and mindless boilerplate statements like this one, quote, For many years, the FBI has engaged with various organizations, both formally and informally. Such outreach is critical, a critical component of the FBI's mission, and we welcome information from these organizations on any possible violation of civil rights, hate crimes, or other potential crimes or threats. We do, however, evaluate our relationships with these groups as necessary to ensure the appropriateness of any interaction. Again, mindless pap that does not answer the question. We can report tonight that Congressman Matt Gates of Florida has sent a letter to FBI leadership asking them to explain their relationship with the SPLC, which is obviously very troubling, to put it mildly. Then tonight, the DOJ gave us another statement. This one said, quote, the attorney general has directed the FBI to reevaluate their relationships with groups like this, the SPLC, to ensure the FBI does not partner with any group that discriminates, end quote, as the SPLC certainly does. Majid Nawaz is the founder of Quilliam. He just received that settlement we mentioned from the SPLC after they libeled him as an extremist. He's also the author of a tremendous book called Radical, My Journey Out of Islamist Extremism. Majid Nawaz joins us tonight. Thanks very much for coming on. So you, it, was, it, it was partly from watching what they did to you that had us asking the question, well, you know, to what extent are they involved with the federal government? And we, we discovered this. But tell our viewers who maybe haven't followed this as close to your experience with the SPLC. Well, it's curious and fascinating at the same time uh, because I have been born and raised a Muslim. I spent the, my teenage years, in fact, with an Islamist organization seeking to uh, enforce Sharia law in Muslim majority societies because I got radicalized. I ended up as a political prisoner in Egypt for my beliefs, um, and it was in jail that I reformed. Uh, my views and came out vowing to challenge Islamist extremism and founded Quilliam in 2008 and have been doing so now for, for 10 years and the Southern Poverty, Poverty Law Center decided to compile a list of what they deemed as anti-Muslim extremists and the oddity, the sheer oddity of placing a Muslim on a list of anti-Muslim extremists is what led me to then say uh, I need justice in this case because uh, my entire life, Tucker, has been defined uh, by my struggle, and I got it wrong initially, I've been open about that, I wrote about it in my book, my struggle to find a place for Muslims in the West that is at home with the West. Um, and, and, yes. and so to undermine my entire life's work by placing me on a list of anti-Muslim extremists, I found a step too far, and that's why um, I went to lawyers and got advice, and uh, it's why we took the action we did. And I can say, as someone who's interviewed scores of people like you, I think you are one of the most restrained and thoughtful and reasonable people on this topic I've ever interviewed. So to call you an extremist is very odd and, and dishonest. Well, so what effect did it, it have on you? Once a group like this d d defines you as an extremist, I mean, that's got to hurt your foundation, I would think. Well, first of all, I've got to say it places a target on the heads. Look, it's, it's no secret. It's already hard enough for Muslim reformers, liberal Muslim reformers, to speak out against extremism within our communities. People that do so are often targeted and often killed. There was a similar list that was published in Bangladesh against so-called Muslim heretics, um, and many of them were knocked off, assassinated by jihadists because they were deemed to be blasphemous or heretical. Uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who has since sought refuge in the United States of America, yes. her, her close friend, a film director, Theo Van Gogh, 
was murdered on the streets of Amsterdam, and then a list was stabbed into his body, and it named Ayan as being next. That's what we're up against here. And so the first thing it did is it placed me in grave danger. It placed Ayan Hirsi Ali in grave danger because she was also named on this list. But it also had material consequences. Um, when they did what they did, the reason they produced these lists is to convince media and to convince philanthropists and foundations not to, not to give grants to these sorts of people or these organizations. And it did have those kind of material consequences for us as well. Um, and it's why we couldn't just lie back and, and, uh, and take this at face value as it was. We had to take action. And I'm glad that you did. And the fact that our FBI is collaborating with a group this discredited and reckless is really scary. Well, as we've told you before on this show and documented pretty conclusively, the Southern Poverty Law Center is a progressive activist group like hundreds of others. But for some reason, the media have anointed them the national arbiters of what is or what is not a hate group, which is a shame since they are totally fake and dishonest. Now, 47 conservative leaders and organizations have released a letter calling on the media to stop citing the Southern Poverty Law Center and its fake data, calling that group correctly discredited and defamatory. Tony Perkins is the president of the Family Research Council, which was once a victim of a terror attack inspired by the SPLC's rhetoric. He joins us tonight. Tony, thanks a lot for coming on. So, um, you, if I'm not misunderstanding this, you're attempting to convince the media to stop taking this fake group seriously, correct? Well, in part. Uh, we're also putting the media on notice that uh, if you are going to take the SPLC, as you described, a liberal activist organization that acts as a, uh, a pit bull for the left, no offense to the pit bulls out there, that uh, they are using that information, putting it up, that they're endangering the lives of people by, by putting up this information from the Southern Poverty Law Center which has no basis in fact or truth. Well, to call someone a hate group is to lump them in, in the popular mind, in my mind anyway, with like Nazis and crazy people, violent people, truly scary people. Well, and that's what they did for the first two decades of their hate list, but uh, two years into the Obama administration, when it was open season on Christian organizations that were opposing the Obama administration, that's when they started adding Christian groups to their list, and they started popping up. Uh, in 2010, when President Obama unleashed his uh, hostility toward religion and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was taking the same agenda overseas. You would think that any normal reporter, no matter how liberal, would be looking through the list of hate groups, so-called hate groups, and say, you know, okay, so, you know, some of them are clearly hateful and crazy. Then they get to the Family Research Council and you say, you know, I, I may not agree with their agenda, but, like, they're not a hate group. Why do, does nobody at, say, CNN or the Washington Post ever think like this is overreached. It's not a hate group, it's a Christian group. Well, it, it, it requires thinking, and I don't think they do. They're, they're taking this, but there's a bigger agenda behind this. The former spokesman for the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, Mark Potox, he, he made very clear, he said, and I'm going to quote from him because I don't get it wrong, he said, you know, we, we don't have any objective criteria here. It's, this is not based on criminality or violence. Quote, we're trying to wreck the groups, we're trying to destroy the groups. This is, again, the left's pit bull going after those who oppose the left's agenda. That's what this is about, and the media needs to be put on record knowing that that's what's behind the SPLC. It's just so dishonest. It's like treating media matters like a legitimate you know, media analysis group, which the press also did until they were called on it repeatedly. Have you had any response from media organizations to your letter? N not, not really. We, with the conservative groups, the conservative media that understands what the SPLC is up to, yes, they are publishing it. Others, you know, not so much so. But here's the thing, Tucker, they now know they have no excuse when there's another attack like we saw against Republicans, uh, the Republican congressman or the attack on the, F, uh, on the FRC five years ago. The media yeah. has, become a, has become complicit in this violence sponsored by, inspired by, I should say, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah, it's just so dishonest. I hate group. What does that even mean? I, I hate that garbage. Tony, thank you so much. Good right, to see Tucker, you tonight. Good to be with you. The Southern Poverty Law Center, or SPLC, is a supposedly charitable organization that fights hate and bigotry using litigation, education, and other forms of advocacy, according to their website. But according to a new investigation by the Washington Free Beacon, it also pays its top directors six-figure salaries and funnels millions of dollars into shady offshore accounts. 
In their investigation, the Free Beacon looked at a bunch of the SPLC's financial forms and found that they had accumulated $328 million in net assets in 2015, which was the most recent tax form they found for the nonprofit. And those same financial forms showed that the SPLC had business interests in the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, and Bermuda. In other words, the nonprofit was funneling money offshore where it can't be subjected to the, all the same laws it would be here. The Free Beacon studied a few years of the SPLC's financial forms and found many instances of the nonprofit transferring millions of dollars offshore. For instance, on March 1st of 2015, they sent a whopping $2.2 million to an entity that is incorporated in the Cayman Islands and run by a firm based in Greenwich, Connecticut. On that exact same day, they transferred another $2.2 million in cash to another business entity with the exact same address as the first. In other words, they transferred $4.4 million in cash in one day to the Cayman Islands. They also give their top executives huge salaries, according to Free Beacon's investigation. They found that the SPLC paid their CEO almost $350,000 in 2015, and their chief trial counsel got just about the same. The minimum base salary for a key employee that year was $140,000, and that doesn't include a bunch of other ways they were compensated financially. Altogether, the SPLC spent $20 million on salaries alone in that same year they transferred that $4.4 million offshore to the Cayman Islands. This is how this nonprofit is fighting hate. Listen, I am all for fighting hate, and I love helping people out. But these big nonprofits are a joke. They're just another way for people to make money off the hate circus. If you really want to fight hate, start in your own neighborhood by being nice to the people you meet face to face. That's it. Just start there. That is something the world is actually in desperate need of. It'll go a lot further toward fighting hate than giving money to these charitable nonprofits who seem a lot less concerned with fighting hate than they are with patting their own pockets.